so thank you very much and welcome um, to this um, seminar week two, where I have the pleasure to um, introduce you to Martina. Martina Tacioli is a reader in politics and technology at Cosmetics College, uh, University of London. She is the author of The Making of Migration, The Biopolitics of Mobility at Europe's Border, Space of Govern Governmentality, Autonomous, Autonomous Migration, and the Arab Uprising and co-author of Tunisia as a Revolutionary Space of Migration. Mm -hmm. Her forthcoming book, Border Abolitionism, Migration Containment and the Genealogies of Struggles by Manchester, and Manchester University Press will come out next year in 2023. She is co-editor in chief of Politics Journal and on the editorial board of Political uh, Geog Geography over research and radical philosophy. So since 2011, Martina, has, Martina Tazzoli has been um, doing research about migration and, and border technology. So um, today she's gonna explain us, um, she's gonna explain us a bit more about what does like border abolitionism, abolitionism um, means, uh, what is like the current situation of um, the refugee uh, context in, in Europe. That's like an introduction. Uh, so I would like to please remind you that um, we encourage open uh, mindedness and value different opinions. So please feel free to um, share always like within a very like respectful um, way. And then uh, please keep your questions for uh, the end of the presentation. And then also participants that are there online, you have on Zoom the question and answer hub channel where you can also share um, there the questions and um, I will be um, I will be managing um, that second like stage of, of the seminar today. So I think that that's um, everything. Um, Martina, the floor is yours. And welcome to the Oxford Institute. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. And thank you for the invitation. So what I'm going to present today is a work in progress, which builds on my uh, fieldwork that I conducted in Greece. I've been conducting research in Greece and in the Mediterranean uh, region um, in over the last uh, six years. So, um, and I would like to start okay so <clears throat> the main focus will be geographical focus will be greece but i will try to uh, make this argument theoretical argument broader and the argument or at least the the question that i would like to discuss with you is how to rethink control uh, how to conceptualize control over refugees beyond an exclusive focus on bias, surveillance, and privacy in a time when digital technologies are very much used at the borders, but also in uh, spaces like refugee camps. So in 2020, the European Commission founded closed refugee camps on the Greek island of Samos, Leros, Kos, Lesbos, and Chios, where the so-called hotspots are located, and I will come back um, to this, explaining what these are. So these sites of migration containment, these new closed refugee camps have been presented as high tech camps that will make possible to keep tra track of refugees and at the same time to make refugees safer, right? So it's very important to bear in mind this ambivalence, how the European Commission and also Greek authorities presented and justify this camp to make, to be able to track them, but also to make refugees safer inside the camp. So, when the first closed camp was open on the island of Samos in September 2021, this was promoted by both European and Greek authorities as a model camp to replicate elsewhere in Greece, but also in Europe. And just, I mean, just for the sake of like knowledge, uh, the European Commission uh, gave around like 275 millions of euro for these uh, five new camps. Uh, and uh, a huge part of this uh, budget has been allocated for implementing um, uh, high-tech uh, tools in the camp. Um, so the EU-funded project has been object of criticism on the part of journalists, NGOs, and human rights organizations, which points us to the risk of enhanced and pervasive surveillance in camps. So this pervasive surveillance, they argue, would be enacted on refugees through cameras installed in the camps on the fences, and through automated gates at the main entry. So I wanted to, this is one of the uh, automated gates. Uh, 
where people who live inside the camps or refugees would have to swipe their asylum card. In Greece, they have this digital card, right? Um, so that the refugees who want to go in, they need to swipe their cards and to put their fingerprints here in order to access the camp. And the same when they need to go out, right? So basically, there's automatized this entry exit system, right? At the gate that before uh, was like um, uh, checked by policemen, right? police officers. And this is in, very important to know that in most of the camps, this is still the case. So the police is there and checks on list written on paper the names of the people if they are authorized uh, to enter or to go out. So uh, this is happening only in few camps, like in Samos, and in the camp of uh, um, uh, the, um, uh, sorry, um, Rizona, which is on the mainland. So this, uh, they have to swipe their card and put their fingerprints to go in and out. And so in this way, every passage is tracked, right? Both of the refugees, but also of the NGO workers who work inside the camp. Um, so the, these automated gates are in the camp of Rizona, Malakaza on the Greek mainland, and in the, uh, on the island of Samos. In the other, uh, in the other camps are still under construction. Uh, <clears throat> so this criticism, as I said, is mainly centered on the risk of pervasive civilians. You see Al Jazeera; they they published this article with drones and thermal cameras. Greek official monitor refugees. Because they, the the goal of this camp, I mean, of these uh, new closed camps, is also to uh, allow Greek authorities to monitor 24 hours what happens inside the camp. So this is a control room based in Athens, from where they can monitor what's happening inside the camps, right? So these cameras are connected to the central room. And for instance, Adri has um, contended that uh, this uh, this kind of like high tech. Uh, experiments look like a dystopian and experimental surveillance project which treats human beings as lab rats, right? So this has been the kind of criticism that has been raised in a place like this that I showed you before is a sort of prison, right? Prison-like, but it's very important. It's not a prison, officially, it's not a prison because asylum seekers are allowed to go in and out during the day, although there are there is a curfew usually at night it depends in some camps is 8 p.m. In other camps is 10 p.m. But it looks very much like a prison in the sense the entry exit is controlled. So this is the, the point, right? That you have this high tech uh, system uh, implemented in the name of refugee safety and in the name of citizen safety against refugees uh, in places that look like prison, although they are not officially detention site. So, but what does it happen behind? and beyond these automated gates, right? Beyond these turn styles. <coughs> so, because indeed, I what I want to suggest today is that an almost exclusive focus on high tech and automated control in camps has contributed to sideline a critique of bordering and carceral mechanism. Also carceral mechanisms which are implemented beyond detention. Because the point here is not that people are fully closed inside, right? They can move, as I said, uh, inside and outside. And also to sideline a critique of humanitarian control. So how control is exercised through humanitarianism and to replace instead this criticism with a criticism centered on bias, surveillance, discrimination, and data privacy. So more precisely, I think there is a risk of looking, of looking at what the European Union invites us, push us to see, right? So they look at these, these gates is very, is, uh, are very, uh, have been very much promoted. If you check uh, online, you will see, uh, uh, I mean, that the, the, many um, people from the European Commission want to inaugurate uh, the camp in Samos, and they, uh, they promote this as a like uh, model camp. So however, arguing this doesn't mean dismissing the risk associated to the implementation of AI and algorithmic driven systems in camp and in the asylum um, regime at large. Rather, the point is to question the extent to which an exclusive attention to what scholars have called techno-humanitarianism leads us to narrow down our understanding of what control means, right? In which, in which way refugee lives are controlled <coughs> beyond tracking, beyond surveillance. And I think that actually is a very important to interrogate how these kind of technologies 
contribute to reshape as well. So it's not these are not it's not irrelevant, right? They have been implemented. And so what I'm interested in discussing today is what do they contribute to strengthen in terms of mechanism of control? Is it really a matter of surveillance and tracking, or is something else? So the exclusive focus on the high tech and on preoccupation for surveillance and bias the factor and force way of seeing migration like a state. Um, so in critical migration literature, all uh, scholars have contended that we uh, we tend to um, uh, interrogate, I mean to to do research on migration, but also in non-academic debates, right? To debate about migration by implicitly. Um, Taking, I mean, uh, assuming the point of view of the state. So interrogating, for instance, ourselves, what does it happen if everyone's arriving in the UK, if everyone lands uh, on the island of Lesbos? So assuming the point of view of the state, right? For instance, without questioning, I mean, I don't know, I take for granted that you all know, but for instance, if I ask, uh, why do you think that these asylum seekers, I mean, even if you don't work <coughs> on migration, but yeah, I'm, I'm sure you have seen images of, refugees, women, children, men, landing on, uh, I mean, um, in Spain, in Greece, in Italy. Why do they come by boat, for instance, and not by plane? Because it's more comfortable than plane. Uh, why? Because they are the visa. Uh, it's the visa, yeah, exactly. So it's the visa system, and it's not about passport, right? So because uh, sometimes in the debate, there is, in the debate also, meaning, <clears throat> uh, not only in academic debates, but in particular in non-academic debates, there is a people, they say, well, maybe they don't have a passport or they don't have money, right? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> it's very important to uh, to inter to deconstruct, right? These, these, um, these uh, take, I mean, this kind of assumption. So um, what does it mean not to see migration like a state and in which way an exclusive focus on technology uh, reinforce this way of seeing migration uh, like a state. So uh, instead, there is much else beyond, in fact, the automated turnstile implemented in some refugee camps. So I think it's key to ask how and in which way, uh, in which forms is control exercised on refugee lives beyond tracking, and how to rethink the critique of refugee carcerality, of carceral modes of containment in light of the implementation of this technology. So in this respect, anthropologist Barbara Pinelli has uh, contended, I quote, that an attentive gaze cannot limit itself to interpreting the most obvious forms of control and surveillance. In the first place, it is necessary to delve beneath the ostensible freedoms and concessions, as well as the imaginaries of humanitarian regime to understand how these also, these also operate in a way that is not only ambiguous and ambivalent, but also violent in its own right. So basically she invites us to um, conceptualize and to interrogate, to investigate, to do research on modes of control that are not narrow to the ostensible, uh, let's say physical restriction, right? Uh, but also to the ostensible concessions given to refugees. <laughs> so um, first of all, as I said, First point, control is not an exercise only to physical restriction and coercion, nor is narrow to track and monitor at a distance. And what is relevant to know about these camps is that, in fact, as soon as these technologies, in particular, some of these cameras have been implemented, refugees started to feel, um, to feel unsafe, unsafer, less safe than before, right? But not from the point of view of being constantly tracked and monitored. Uh, so what really affected the, I mean, the lives of the people in camps is, and this is my first point, if you want, preliminary point, is uh, the unevenness and the discretionary power through which this control is exercised. So that they don't know uh, when they are watched. Uh, and also they know that in some cases, uh, these technologies work in other cases, they simply don't work, right? So this sense of uh, this feeling of uh, being unsafe, right? That is not necessarily connected to um, mobility restrictions. And actually, most I mean, these camps have been open, these new camps, when the mobility restrictions that have been implemented during COVID-19 have been lifted. So refugees in Greece have been um, subjected to 
uh, uh, discriminatory lockdowns inside the camps and in the hotspot. So for much longer than Greek citizen or other I mean, no migrants living in Greece. Uh, so they were obliged to stay in the camps, right? Uh, in the name of uh, what I call this principle of contain uh, to protect. So in the name of their own safety. So the official discourse was we keep you inside in order to prevent that you get COVID and also to, to um, defend citizen from migrants as potential vehicles of uh, tra transmission, right, of the virus. So these kind of restrictions have been uh, partially lifted little by little. I mean, it, it, they lasted for long, for much longer than the peak of COVID-19. But um, uh, at some point, so for one year and a half, basically, uh, but at some point they have been lifted. Uh, they have been lifted officially. In reality, uh, there are like a series of arbitrary control at the gate, even in those places where there are the automated gates. So because there are the automated gates, but far from being a fully automatized system, there is always a policeman that checks who is entering, who is going in and who is going out. And since most of the times the gates do not work for the people with the, with the cart, right? There is always a policeman that decide if you are going in or if you are allowed to go in or not. Um, so I think it's key to attend uh, the relationship between the visible presence of tracking system in camps, actual mobility restriction and refugees perception of unsafety. This doesn't mean assuming straightforward connection between the presence of technology and perception of unsafety or reversely perception of being safer inside the camp. To the contrary is a question of taking into account the ambivalent and nuanced perception of unsafety played out through the entanglements of mobility restriction and monitoring technology. So um, what uh, mean many like residents, right, in the camp uh, told me, and not only to me, also to NGO uh, who are uh, in these camps, uh, is that they, um, they feel uh, unsafe being inside because they feel that they don't have, they are, they are not allowed to have an independent and autonomous life. So they feel controlled, but not in the sense of being necessarily police, right? What they don't care about their movements being tracked, but the fact that as long as they try to do anything uh, independent out of what uh, is established by humanitarian organization, they are immediately either criminalized or checked by the police uh, for instance, to give you a concrete example, uh, asylum seekers uh, uh, in these camps are not allowed to cook their own meals, right? So there is this like uh, obstruction uh, to any form of autonomous social reproduction activity, okay? On the other, on the other side, many of these uh, refugees uh, are scared about, sorry, about um, leaving the camp because they, it, paradoxically, this form of containment <coughs> makes them feel safer than going out with no protection. Because you can imagine after uh, a journey of months, years for some people where they've been exposed to multiple forms of violence, many of them are also traumatized, but also those without trauma, they end up in a space where there is very, very basic humanitarian uh, support, humanitarian aid, uh, but where they think that if they go out, uh, because they can go out uh, during uh, some, I mean, uh, some hours in, in, of the day, uh, they, have, they are not equipped, right? Because they everything is made in this camp for keeping them inside. So they have this anxiety about, okay, go out and now I'm not able to, to stay outside, right? Um, for instance, uh, schools are, uh, built inside these camps in order to discourage them from going out, saying, okay, you can stay inside. You don't need, you kids, you don't need to go out. So everything is made for uh, concentrating them inside. So um, while these technologies are supposed to streamline border controls and the logistics of humanitarianism, and this is one of the reasons why they have been implemented, right? To streamline border checks at the gate, for instance, they are actually constantly subjected to glitches and disruption, and they are, they are implemented and used in a very uneven, arbitrary way by police and camp authorities. However, this should not lead us to conclude that they fail. 
So the point is not simply that this technology failed. Uh, there are glitches all the time. So for instance, in some of these camps, like the camps uh, or Arizona, uh, the gates have been implemented and didn't work for months. Uh, they have been, they've not been activated, <laughs> right? And at some point they've been activated, but they stopped working after a few days, right? So there are glitches. But I think that what is interesting is to understand, and this is what I'm gonna uh, uh, go now with, uh, with the presentation, how these glitches are constitutive, this failure of the um, failed infrastructure of humanitarian. So, um, see here I want to show you, give you uh, an idea of uh, this camp. Okay. Here, um, so these are is a map of the camps in Greece. As you can see, there are camps everywhere. Greece is the only country. Well, even in in, um, in Croatia, there are camps, but it's <coughs> likely. I mean, not that big. Is the only European countries with refugee camps. Huh? These refugee camps have all been built with European money. And here, uh, so this is the island of Lesbos, Chios, Samos, Lero, the Pops, <laughs> where the, um, uh, the hotspot is uh, infrastructure that have been opened by the European Commission in 2015, uh, have been located. And other hotspots are in Italy. So uh, in 2020, the European Commission decided to transform these hotspots in so-called closed camps, as I told you before. So the hotspots were originally conceived for uh, identifying uh, migrants in the uh, fastest possible way. This was the purpose, right? The official purpose of the, the European Commission and to select between those in, uh, uh, who, are, I mean, who are eligible for international protection and those who should be deported, right? In reality, people remain stranded on these islands for months and many for one year, two years, for many reasons. The first one is that, um, I mean, there was a logistical failure in like transferring them to the mainland, uh, like lack of um, uh, personnel in an infrastructure on the mainland. Well, now there are camps, but the main reason is because in 2016, the European Commission signed, the European Union signed an agreement with Turkey, the so-called EU Turkey deal that established what has been called geographical restriction. So basically, people who are um, who arrive on this island uh, are not allowed to move to the mainland until when they receive the result of their asylum application. So this produced like this, all this like concentration of people on this uh, tiny island. Uh, and here there are many camps, in particular uh, close to Athens, uh, and however are not that close. So the interesting thing is that. Uh, they are, uh, they've been located uh, in a very remote area in the middle of nowhere. So it takes you know, like one hour, two hours by car uh, to <laughs> go to these camps and nearby there is absolutely, uh, there is an, uh, anything, right? Um, and the same close to Thessaloniki. Um, so even if people are allowed to go out, uh, so you have these camps with a automated turnstile, walls surrounding the camp, uh, with this arbitrary um, possibility, right? So but the discretionary powers about who can go out and who, and who cannot go out, who is not allowed to go out. But even when they go out, there is absolutely nothing, right? It's the same, uh, similar things with the, uh, with the island, right? If you are on an island, you are um, basically in a, uh, in a prison. And what is happening uh, these days, uh, you might be familiar with this, is that uh, there are like, there has been a, a, an increase in pushback, right, from to Turkey, from Greece to Turkey. Um, and it's interesting that um, Ilva Johansson from the European Commission declared, declared recently, it's a moment when arrivals have been at their lowest for eight years. Backlogs have been clear. Facilities are less crowded. Progress is being made. So the reason why these arrivals have not been registering the statistics is because many people are pushed back and they are not even counted. So the, ma many of the refugees who land on the island are not even fingerprinted and they are pushed back before being fingerprinted because paradoxically in this case registration 
biometric registration can be turned uh, uh, against the state, try right, to prove that these people have landed. Um, so Greece has become, I um, mean, um, uh, in, as, as, as been in the in the spotlight, right, media spotlight uh, over the last seven years since 2015, when the so-called refugee crisis uh, started, right, for a series of reasons. So the so-called Euturkey deal that I just explained, uh, the hotspot approach, uh, and more broadly, and coming going back to um, technology, um, Greece started to be considered at some point as a laboratory, as a bad test of uh, European uh, migration policies. And in part, this is true uh, in the sense that Greece, unlike Italy, for instance, uh, relies much more on European Union funding, right? So they are also more monitored by <coughs> the European Commission. Uh, and as I said, these new camps have been completely funded by the European Commission. Um, on the other, I think it's important not to fall in the trap of the techno hype in the sense that in Greece, there are all these technologies in the mid, in a, I mean, incorporated in a system that is still very much based on paper-based paper documents. And that requires that people show up in person, for instance, to claim asylum on the mainland, people need to go at, physically at the police station to claim asylum with the risk of being detained and then uh, deported, right? So it's precisely this interesting mix between digitalization of the asylum system uh, is the first country that adopted a, a mandatory Skype call system uh, in 2016 that refugee, sorry, people who want to claim asylum need to use in order to lodge their asylum application. Then the Skype system has been scrapped um, uh, in, 2000, in 2021. So this partial digitalization of asylum with the persistence of non-digital paper for me is what makes of Greece a very interesting case more than a country where there has been just like a linear progressive um, digitalization. So the technological disruption of asylum take, uh, I mean, uh, happen in a very, like, very often in refugee humanitarianism, and as I said, are not side effects, nor are they simply glitches. Rather, this technological disruption underpin the daily humanitarian logistics as well as asylum procedures. So in fact, what characterized the way in which control is exercised in refugee camps is precisely this unevenness and arbitrariness that disorient refugees, render them unsafe and drive them mad, right? This is problem of the production of madness in camps. But in particular, um, these technologies, uh, these uh, I mean, cameras, but also these automated gates, right? In particular that have been, as I said, really um, in the spotlight um, are used for disrupting any forms of autonomous activity. For instance, asylum seekers, so there are the automated gates, but what happens is that when people arrive there, they, uh, so it seems like smoothening access, but uh, there are few steps before reaching the gates. So the police check, there is always a police officer that checks if the person has, for instance, food, both from outside. So they are not, most of the time, they're not allowed to bring food. And uh, what happens if they lose uh, their cards? That is very common, might happen, right? Um, so the, there are people are not, I mean, asylum seekers who, are, who live in the camp are not allowed to re-enter the camp <coughs> and they need to find, to justify themselves, to prove that they are resident. Another case that is very like, is very much a problem at the moment is that Asylum seekers usually are not <laughs> given this card be, uh, until 25 days after landing, after being identified. So for 25 days, they are entrapped in the camp. And in many cases, if the, even after that date, um, they don't receive it. So in principle, it's 25 days. So they need to find excuse or reason for going out of the camp. Um, so. The technological disruption of asylum are grounded, I contend, in an economy of induced scarcity. That is, basic life support infrastructure are often misfunctioning or do not work at all in refugee camps. In other cases, they work through precarious systems or are not in place at all. So if, we, if you think about 
uh, I mean, uh, this image, right? So this uh, high tech camp uh, surrounded, imagine, by a wall like this, right? This is Rizona camp. So you see very uh, traditional wall, right? And then you have these automated gates, right? Um, so the, the paradox is that in these uh, high-tech camps, model camps, uh, the first, the, the, the key infrastructural failures uh, are very basic and uh, have nothing to do with the high-tech, but I think this to, that is interesting to see how these two levels, right? The high-tech and infrastructural failures are connected. So infrastructural failures concern mainly electricity and running water. Electricity inside the camp in Lesbos depends on 12 generators and today only eight works. Glitches, glitches happen all the time, so the camp remain, might remain without electricity. Plus, in order to save money, after 9 p.m., the authorities switched electricity off, rendering the camp even more unsafe. So it's very common that women in particular um, not only get scared, but they also uh, like, um, have, have been victims of sexual violence inside the camp or that, for instance, the, the containers where they live, in particular single women, cannot be locked from inside. Now, so at night is, is uh, dangerous. So on May 2022, women, men, and children who stay in the refugee camp on the island of Lesbos have remained with no electricity for about two weeks. Similarly, in the famous high-tech camp of Samos, so this one, um, promoted by the EU as a high-tech facility, Asylum seekers have been left without running water for about three weeks in spring 2022. And many NGOs uh, I mean, spoke about this, the irony, right? Of um, uh, that these repeated infrastructure failures happen in camps that are presented as high tech and as modern for the rest of Europe, right? So what might appear, however, as an infrastructural clash, right? So you have this high tech and then you don't have running water, you don't have electricity for three weeks, and this is a constant like switching on and off, right, of technology that work and then suddenly don't work. And this really failure uh, pro uh, of providing like humanitarian support, I think is precisely the way in which, con I mean, is like the um, uh, summarize very well how control is exercised in camp. So this, this failure is part of the way carcerality is enforced even beyond special fixation, even beyond immobilization. And for me, this is uh, the point, right? That this technology pushes us to interrogate what does, what is carcerality? What is carcerality when it's not only a matter of detaining a person inside a space, when people are not completely mobilized because in fact they can go out. And if you interview migrants outside the camp of Lesbos, most of them might tell you, I'm fine. I mean, I'm going out. There are no restrictions. Some others might tell you, well, I've been blocked at the gate because I was bringing inside alcohol or cigarettes or also because I was just, I mean, I've just done my grocery and they blocked me randomly. But overall, nobody can. So the point is, uh, which kind of criticism can we raise to these camps when they are not fully, I mean, space of detention, right? And when we know that this technology partially work, partially don't work, but most importantly, uh, are not conceived for this purpose. And this is uh, what I found out, uh, I mean, uh, interviewing also um, uh, the, the manager of the camp. This is the camp on, on the island of Lesbos that is not high tech at all. As you can see, these are UNHR tents. So this is uh, the camp, the, the, the main gates, like controlled by policemen. <laughs> So in Lesbos, they are about to build this new closed camp, which will look like Samos, right? Um, so, and if you interview camp authorities, right? In all this, I mean, I interview camp authorities from different camps. They told me, well, first, uh, in all confidence, we are not interested in tracking refugees because we have the opposite problems that we don't know where to put them. Unfortunately, people cannot disappear from the island. Right. So the point is that uh, in Greece at the moment, there is a law, uh, a new measure, right, um, uh, enforced uh, in 2000, sorry, in June 2021, that established that Turkey is a safe country and that people coming from five countries, Bangladesh, Somalia, Pakistan, Syria, um, and Afghanistan, um, might not be eligible 
to claim asylum. Of course, it's a complete violation of international law because this means that they cannot even apply for asylum. And applying for asylum uh, is a right. Everyone of us has the right to claim asylum, which doesn't mean that you will be granted refugee status, right? So in this way, these people have been <laughs> illegalized preventively. So there is, if you look at the statistics, 98% of Somali, and now there are many people coming from Somalia because they fly to Turkey because they don't need a visa, and then they try to come to Lesbos. 98% is, is, is rejected, right? In a, after two or three days because of this law. So what happens is that Greece um, has the, I mean, has to manage the presence of this illegalized person, illegalized by the state, uh, on an island, right? Without knowing where to send them. Okay. So the the last uh, goal is to keep track of them. The point is how to make them disappear. And now the authorities do it is a, through um, unofficial uh, measures. For instance, putting on their uh, paper that says your asylum application is not, you cannot apply for asylum, a stamp say, that allows them to go to the port in Lesbos to take a ferry and to go to the mainland and then to try to, I mean, you, of course, they don't have legal status, so they try then to travel illegally to other countries. So we, we are not interested. Second, uh, apart from this, so we need to look at the, um, the what, what's, what's happening behind the gates are also this political tension between Greece and the European Union, right? And second, uh, both officially and unofficially camps, these the automated gates are built for controlling who is getting who is getting in, who is entering the camp, more <coughs> than preventing people from going out. And this is quite interesting. So this, the point is to avoid that smugglers can go in, but also that what camp authorities define as spontaneous arrivals. By spontaneous arrivals, they refer to people who uh, maybe are asylum seekers, but don't have a, the right to stay in the camp because they have been rejected, or migrants who decided not to apply for asylum and who enter the camp. So it's very interesting, if you want, phenomenon of people who try to get into the camp to squat a container and to leave because they don't have uh, an accommodation. So in order to prevent this spontaneous arrival, um, they try to stay in the camp. So the, the, the function of this technology is also to control that only authorize residents stay in the camp because the idea is to um, reduce uh, the, the humanitarian to seize down uh, the pool of people who, are, who can access humanitarian aid, uh, accommodation, welfare system, and also cash assistance. Um, so uh, I think that what is at stake in this um, way of exercising control is what um, these two scholars, Brett Nielsen and Ned Rossiter, uh, have defined as way of extracting more from less. So of capitalizing, but not in the sense only of making profit in a direct way, right? So there is a literature on migration industry that are, explains very well how I mean, private actors, high-tech companies um, make profit by keeping people in detention, right? Or by implementing new technology at the border. But there is also a way of like extracting value and in particular of exercising control by withdrawing, right? The kind of support more and more. So by keeping refugees in a state of dependency because how control works, as I said, is hampering autonomous social reproduction activities. So then you remain dependent on humanitarian actors because you're not allowed to do otherwise. And at the same time, however, uh, <laughs> through this politics of produce scarcity. So living with this very little uh, support. So to be under control is, are all the autonomous spaces of livability, which are preventively choked, right? So um, to conclude, I think that for me uh, is, uh, is key to uh, understand how this technological disruption that <coughs> I mean, I'm happy also to describe more in the Q&A, unveil this constitutive arbitrariness and discretionary dimension of control of control, as I said, is exercised very much beyond physical restriction, beyond detention, um, and that uh, cannot be fully grasped if we um, uh, draw our attention exclusively on modes of control through surveillance and on the form of 
and on the um, uh, uh, and, and if we replicate uh, discourse on data privacy violation of data privacy as a way for articulating our critique of the <laughs> high tech and also of the low tech because this is what I illustrate right that it is entanglement of low tech and high tech in camps but also taking seriously the ambivalence of refugees and safety uh, through tech so in which way technology contribute to um, to this sense of unsafety of being uh, in a prison. This is what a, a, a psychologist who works in one of these camps told me. They feel that they are in an asylum, not even in a prison, even worse, in an asylum, even if they are free to go out, right? And technologies contribute to this sense of uh, feeling to be like in an asylum. And uh, I would like to conclude an open conclusion that for me, I mean, if we want to mobilize an abolitionist critique to camps, right? But also to modes of containment uh, is important nowadays to excavate these multiple and mutual, sorry, entanglements between modes of carcerality beyond detention and form and technologies that are used for, uh, not only for keeping track, right? <coughs> Some of these technologies are of course used for keeping track, but bearing in mind that there are also other uh, goals, political goals at stake. And by not taking uh, privacy surveillance and discrimination as the main starting point, because this uh, implies the fact of reiterating a citizen or at least a state-based gaze, right? To look at this technology through the gaze that the European Commission uh, invites us to see. Okay, thank you very much, Martina, for your um, very interesting um, presentation. So, am I asking you if there's like any question here in the room? I don't see if there's like any. There's no questions. Well, um, I have some questions. Yeah. Ah, there's one question. Yeah, I was very curious to understand if there's any sort of policy solution being discussed, even just at the academic level, around uh, strategies for regaining autonomy over living spaces in refugee camps, uh, given the you know findings brought forward by the technological aspect you've mentioned. Yeah, so as I said, in relation to technology per se, the criticism has been more, almost exclusively centered on surveillance. There have been criticism about like, broader criticism about, okay, this camp are prison because of technology, but not only because of that, because people are kept inside, but has never been framed the criticism in the sense that you said, right? Uh, there are many policy recommendation and uh, humanitarian programs for empowering refugees, right? And this is what NGOs try to do also in camp. But the paradox is again, that um, what does it mean to empower someone, right? In a space where actually, you cannot, you can barely decide, right? On, on your life, you're not even allowed. So everything is made for uh, preventing that you're able to build your <laughs> autonomous life space. So there are definitely these plenty of programs for empowering refugees. Uh, since this year in Greece, they also started project for integrating refugees in the labor market. You say, okay, how can you work, right? While you are in a space like this. Um, there are important, the reason, I mean, there are organizations who try to provide important psychological support, but the point is that um, the, the, the dis disruption to autonomous space of livability are not a uh, question, right? Uh, yeah, thank you for the presentation. I was wondering uh, what's then the specificity of a the high tech camp with all the disrupt disrupts that you have like uh, stressed out, uh, because in the end maybe we can see that the carcerality feeling and all is maybe more created or produced by the interactions with the police, uh, maybe in the camp uh, by the fact of living on an <laughs> island, uh, by the limbus in the law and all. So. What's the difference, in fact, in a high-tech uh, camp in comparison with another camp, like more classical, but uh, with yeah. surveillance in the end? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think if, for instance, if you ask this question to the camp manager, they would say not no difference, because this is this is what is interesting, that for, that, for those who work on the ground yeah. and who are in charge of keeping track of refugees, 
very little has changed, right? Because, okay, what the police has done before anyway, you have to deploy <coughs> the police man anyway, because there is this. So in the end, it's not, it's not even about saving money or saving time, right? In reality, what I was trying, I mean, the, so this is the first point. I think it's important not to fall in this techno hype, right? And this is the first point. The second point is that, however, there is a, a sort of like uh, effect on refugees because of course they, in the same way that they promoted this technology to us, right? To people who look at these camps, who do research in this camp or, or, or to the Greek citizen, they also show to refugees that there are these additional forms of control that produce further anxiety about uh, not being able to structure, for instance, the previous camp in Lesbos, not this that I show, the hotspot of Moria that you might have heard was set on fire in September. So it was a for, for sort of slum, right? And everyone was criticizing the slum, saying horrible condition, and it's true, but people were able to create their informal lives inside. Okay. Here is much less, indeed, is a, a sort of like semi-prison, very clean, but semi in Samos is even less. The like Samos where there are the automatic gates, because in that case, it's like they they feel that. <coughs> There is this sort of like potential surveillance, which in the end is not even sometimes there, right? But and what is perceived, it, it matters, right? Uh, uh, and also uh, the carcerality is, uh, is in part uh, produced by this, like hampering people from uh, building broader social relationship because the fact that nobody can go inside, if you, in this case, it's really impossible because it's not only about the card, you can, give your, the car to your friend, but you need the fingerprints, right? So it's really about, okay, who, this space is becoming like an exclusive space for only for the authorized presence. So the point is to reduce the people who are entitled to an accommodation to, and to rights in a way. And it's part of the camp should be abolished, but for some people is really the, the only way where in order not to be homeless, for instance, not, is the ambivalence. And for me, the is push us to see, okay, how can I elaborate a critique of camps mm -hmm. when these camps actually, I mean, if you compare with Moria, uh, it's true that these camps is less crowded and people can just swipe their cards and go inside or looks is not uh, fine. Uh, and they can also go out. So you cannot even criticize because the problem of this gate is not that they don't let you out. So I will um, translate or like communicate um, two questions that we have online. So the first one is uh, made by Sophie Bernani Taylor. And she says, I did some research last year on modes of refugee governmentality that occur outside of camps, Look at, looking at prepayment card given to asylum seekers in the UK. From your perspective, what can abolitionist critiques offer for these forms of social <laughs> control that occur outside of bounded space like camps? So how can we translate this uh, abolitionist critique into like out of the camp? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks for the question. I, uh, do you want to collect the others? Or? Uh, uh, up to that... you, what do you want? I don't mind, I don't mind, up to you. No, no, okay. Uh, no, no, thanks for the question. I I, I think is uh, is key uh, for me as well to, understand um, whether or not an abolitionist framework can be used for elaborating a broader criticism of the border regime, which doesn't mean just, uh, I mean, calling for abolishing borders, right? Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, um, abolition is, uh, if we take in the spirit of like the carceral abolition, feminist carceral abolitionist tradition that builds on slavery abolitionists, so the work of Angela Davis or Ruth Gilmore, um, that builds on W.B. Du Bois' uh, conceptualization of <laughs> abolitionism. Um, for me, abolitionism is not about just say, okay, let's shut down the camps or uh, because you, I just explained the ambivalence also of, the, of how people, in this case, when Moria was burned, they wanted a place to stay or let's uh, smash the border because it's, a, well, in principle, I'm, I'm aligned with that position, but it's not enough, right? Um, uh, so this carceral abolitionist tradition uh, tell you that the point is how to imagine, so building on this concept of abolition democracy, right? How to conceive a society in which uh, <laughs> mobility um, it becomes like, for instance, um, is not, I mean, in which the, there is no possibility to replicate racialized forms of surveillance, right? But also in which mobility per se becomes part of, part of a politics of 
commoning, right? Where the, 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 the act of moving of anyone is not considered as a form of threat. So um, in my, in, from my point of view, and also because also most of my work is not about camps as such, right? Refugee camps, but about movements, for instance, at the internal borders of Europe or how people uh, are get dispersed uh, within Europe in places like at the French Italian borders or in Calais. I think that uh, the question of abolitionism is, is cannot focus on discrete sites like the camp and the border, but is about uh, how to um, uh, how to conceive a society in which that is not in which mobility or better problematic mobility, because migration in the end is about problematic mobility, uh, uh, is not we don't look at it from the point of view of the state, right? Uh, Okay. So there is another question by Margie Chisman, and she says, thank you uh, for a brilliant talk, Martina. Uh, many inspiring <coughs> points. One question might be, in critical border migration studies, the autonomy of migration approach has become a popular ground up perspective. Your abolitionist perspective on carcerality takes a crucial and different tack. How would you compare and contrast the two yeah. perspectives? Uh, okay, so in, in this book that Anna just mentioned in the introduction called Border Abolitionism, I try precisely to bridge, right, the autonomy of migration literature and, the border, and border abolitionism uh, from the point of view of like the politicization of um, the cons I mean, of the escape, right, of the figure of the runaway um, uh, that abolitionism speaks about with the right to escape that authors like Sandro Mezzada have developed. Um, and so by putting into a historical perspective, right, the current, uh, the current forms of mobility and to situate in a broader genealogy of criminalization of mobility. Uh, and for me, uh, what is interesting, uh, I mean, <coughs> in terms of complementing autonomy of migration uh, with uh, uh, abolitionist literature is precisely this um, focus on the constituent moment so that we cannot simply look at the moment when migrants manage to cross and to exceed right border controls and and to reverse the gaze seeing how board, um, migration movements push states to find new mode, modes of capture but also how this is turned into uh, in, in some cases right uh, into um, uh, forms of like commoning right and our abolition is uh, force us to um, rethink the critical borders beyond the no border movements. So that what is really a matter of rethinking um, how it can be part of a broader project, anti-racist project, right? That doesn't start from migration and that try as a first thing to destabilize the difference between citizen and migrant. Okay. Well, then she says, um, to elaborate a bit, how can the abolitionist approach account for subversion by and tactics of refugees, including their social reproduction in spite of carcerality? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't think that we need to explain everything through an abolitionist approach, right, in this sense. Uh, but abolitionist approach for me is, um, I mean, the, so one side is the deconstructive side, right? Uh, the critique of modes of containment beyond detention, because this is, if you just seem to transpose uh, car carceral abolitionism, you can easily, not that easily, but anyway, uh, find like elaborate a critique of detention center uh, beyond, I mean, that challenge the politics, what Ruth Gilmore calls the politics of white innocence, right? According to which, okay, migrants are, um, uh, are, in, are there, but are innocent and like criminals. And I think that our abolitionist critiques push us to challenge this, say, well, this is, not the only point, we need to criticize both the prison and the detention center, but also there is the other part of the abolitionist literature, which is about um, retracing a genealogy of solidarity and looking at how past movements have influenced current one. And so for me, this, as you, as you call it, like tactics of refugee subversion, for me is interesting to, uh, from an abolitionist point of view, um, to look at the circulation of knowledge uh, migrants' knowledge, like this sub subversive knowledge, um, how this is uh, circulates across space, but also over time, right? So how this uh, counter knowledge uh, is sedimented and is reactivated uh, by migrants themselves. 
So I think that this is for me something that has been less explored by the autonomy of migration and that can be taken from that abolitionist uh, tradition. Uh, are there any like uh, examples of like efforts within these camps, either through like maybe like language lessons or like social touch points between um, the people of the country where these camps are uh, that are like maybe helping to prepare the people in these camps for a potential future where there may be integration or like the legal infrastructure for that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> there are, there are, there are association in terms of like, um, uh, like improving like uh, your uh, uh, linguistic skills or also now, and this is the first year that in Greece that is, has always been considered a country of transit. Now there are this project also run by UNHCR and IUM uh, to uh, integrate refugees in the labor market. But you, if you look at the numbers, you see that the people who apply for these schemes are like dozens, not thousands. So because people don't want to remain in Greece, so they don't want to find a job. And also what is interesting is that many of the, of, even among those who receive the refugee status, they prefer to remain invisible in the system. So for instance, they don't want, even if they get a job to have a reg, they prefer to have a job sometimes in the black market because they have this fear. And this is also interesting in terms of how knowledge circulates, in some cases also fake knowledge, uh, that if they travel, for instance, to Germany, where many people want to go, and there is a evidence in a database that they have been workers in Greece, they cannot prove that in Greece they were destitute because there is this, I mean, uh, is one of the bases on the grounds uh, you, up, upon which like they can claim asylum again in Germany, or at least Germany accept their, uh, uh, their application, even if they're refugees, they were refugees in Greece, if they can prove that they were destitute in Greece and they are scared, right? So in some cases, refugees themselves are skeptical about it. Mm -hmm. There are ways for integrating, but the point is that they, most of them don't want to integrate in Greece and that Greece, I mean, there is a huge, uh, I mean, uh, or at least there has been until very recently a huge economic crisis. So it, what does it mean to get integrated, right? With, so there's a problem of, yeah, um, impossibility to some extent, but definitely there are many NGOs, yeah, doing this kind of job, yeah. I wonder if there's any positive example of technology that has been deployed or proposed for uh, refugees that actually benefit them, or if you find only like negative like examples in your life. Yeah, yeah, there are. I mean, uh, also activists and NGOs have um, put in place some like technology. If you think if by technology, I can include also app, for instance. Um, uh, yes, uh, most of the apps are quite pointless to refugees, but for instance, just uh, yesterday or two days ago, Sea Watch, uh, the NGOs that rescue migrants at sea, announced that they are uh, gonna um, uh, launch an app next month that will help ref uh, people who seek asylum to um, <laughs> to report their uh, location in real time. Have you seen? Okay, to to uh, prevent that they they are pushed back and also to 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 claim asylum uh, in the place where they arrive. Um, and then there are technologies. I mean, technology per se, for instance, as I said, uh, biometrics, right? That is a, a technology used systematically by state authorities to um, uh, to identify uh, migrants at the internal and external borders. And that 90% of the time is turned against them because it's okay, you are track, no? But it's also true that there are places where the fact of being uh, identified, uh, being fingerprinted, is used for by lawyers for um, for uh, exposing state violation. And for instance, uh, the systematic pushback that happened at the Spanish-French border, French-Italian borders are done without fingerprinting migrants on purpose for not leaving digital trace. So while in those cases, having the digital trace uh, is useful for migrants and for lawyers to try to make the case that they have been pushed back. So it's also interesting how state themselves sometimes try not to use technology. And machine translator, no? <laughs> like machine, like Google uh, no? yeah. translator, they use this to translate like from one language to another language, to another language. So it's six o'clock. We start a bit late. Do you want to keep it here or is there another question? I can ask you like last question if I may. Um, 
they're like kind of like specific questions about the situation in the council. So when you show the image of the biometric um, gate, what about minors? So do also minors have to fingerprint? So are also like minors yeah. fingerprinted? Yeah. And then in, in in that case, what about like the GDPR? It's like the GDPR. Um... Yeah, I mean, the, what they say, but as, as I said, it's just, uh, it's just started, right? So there's been no clarity, but, but is that the data is, um, is kept uh, by, I mean, on a local level. So it's kept by inside the camp, right? So basically the camp, uh, camp authorities and there are IT person inside the camp who check this uh, have this uh, um, di digital records of who enter and who exit and this is uh, used this is what they say exclusively for uh, monitoring who is entitled to accommodation because basically how it works is that if for many days you don't re-enter the camp you are excluded from the accommodation so this what they say is that they don't use and how they justify for uh, for tracking the people, right? But of course, <laughs> that has been, I mean, is a, one of the grain grounds uh, that NGOs use for criticizing uh, this technology, because it's true that in principle, I mean, there can be this kind of thing. Okay, so thank you very much for coming here. Thank you very much, uh, Martina, for okay. commuting from, from London. Um, yeah, uh, thank you so much for that um, very interesting um, lecture today. And yeah, um, well, we have like another um, another uh, se um, seminar next week. So I hope that um, you have enjoyed uh, Martina's lecture. Thank you so much for coming again. And I hope that, um, yeah, uh, take care. Thank you.